Hi, what's up? How you doing? Should I do a normal beginning? Hello, word nerds! Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. All right, let's get into it. First is Amen Corner. Two words, A-M-E-N-C-O-R-N-E-R. This is a noun from circa 1848. A conspicuous corner in a church occupied by fervent worshipers. As I've uh, mentioned in the past, I'm not particularly religious, so I haven't really spent a lot of time in churches, especially just for religious purposes. Uh, Mostly it's been weddings and such, but I didn't realize there was a thing called an amen corner. Maybe I'm just sheltered. All right, next is amend, A-M-E-N-D. This is a verb from the 13th century. Transitive definitions. One, to put right especially to make emendations in as a text. 2a. To change or modify for the better. Improve is a synonym, as in amend the situation. 2b. To alter especially by phraseology, especially to alter formerly by modification, deletion, or addition, as in amend a constitution. Intransitive definition is to reform one's self. For the whole thing, we have the synonym correct. C-O-R-R-E-C-T. Amendable is an adjective, and amender is a noun. The etymology says a bunch of stuff. Uh, It's from Anglo-French amender, which is modified of Latin emendare, which is from... X, E, or X, which means out, plus menda, which means fault. It's akin to the Latin mendax, which means lying. Uh, Also, mendicus, which means beggar. And perhaps to the Sanskrit minda, which means physical defect. Next is amendatory. This is an adjective from 1764, and we just have the synonym corrective. Next is amendment. This is a noun from the 13th century. One, the act of amending. Synonym is correction. Two, a material, as compost or sand, that aids plant growth indirectly by improving the condition of the soil. 3a, the process of amending by parliamentary or constitutional procedure. 3b, an alteration proposed or effected by this process, as in a constitutional amendment. I like the synonym in the first definition, uh, the word correction, because especially if you look at our constitution here in America, it has a bunch of amendments. And when you when you use the, the term correction um, as a description for amendment, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, they wrote the Constitution many, many, many years ago, and things were different back then, and change is inevitable, and so to keep up with the times, we had to start creating amendments or corrections to the Constitution. I think it only makes sense, and, you know, eventually, we might have to make amendments to the amendments. I'm no expert, but I wouldn't be surprised if that has already happened and I'm just dumb and don't realize it because I haven't really studied the Constitution well. But yeah, to keep up with the times, you have to keep on making corrections uh, for what's right for that time. I will stop talking about politics now. Next, we have amends, A-M-E-N-D-S. This is a noun from the 14th century. Compensation for a loss or injury. Synonym is recompense, R-E-C-O-M-P-E-N-S-E, as in make amends. The etymology uh, says it's from Anglo-French amende, which means reparation. My wife and I just watched an episode of Full Frontal with Samantha B where she had a whole big segment about reparations for African Americans because of slavery. And it was a very interesting uh, deep dive into that. So if you're uh, able to watch that, I recommend it. Uh, And if not, go look into uh, possible reparations. Uh, From what I understand, they don't exist yet. America hasn't decided yet to give uh, reparations to the descendants of the slaves. 
So maybe that'll happen in the future. Next is amenity, A-M-E-N-I-T-Y. This is a noun from the 14th century. 1A, the quality of being pleasant or agreeable. 1B1, the attractiveness and value of real estate or of a residential structure. 1B2, a feature conducive to such attractiveness and value. 2 is usually plural, something as a conventional social gesture that conduces to smoothness or pleasantness of social relationships, as in maintaining social amenities. 3. Something that conduces to comfort, convenience, or enjoyment, as in hotels with modern amenities. The etymology says this is from the Latin amoenus, A-M-O-E-N-U-S, which means pleasant. Next is amenorrhea, A-M-E-N-O-R-R-H-E-A. Because uh, a good portion of the word is similar to the word diarrhea, I'm sort of assuming that these are related, but let's find out. This is a noun from circa 1771, abnormal absence or suppression of menses or menses. And amenorrheic is an adjective. So uh, menses would be uh, a woman's monthly period, from what I understand. And so if a woman um, doesn't have one, or uh, has an abnormal schedule of one, I guess, that would be called uh, amenorrhea, or they would have amenorrhea, or they would be amenorrheic. I'm learning all these words. Uh, And the etymology says this is from the Greek men, which means month. Interesting that it's the word men. Uh, Plus the new Latin O plus rhea, R-R-H-E-A, and there's more at the word moon, which, of course, is uh, interesting because it's often called maybe the moon cycle or there's always been a relationship between women's cycles and the moon. Um, Whether there actually is a relationship, I'm not actually sure, but I know that those two are often uh, connected. Next, we have ament or ament. A-M-E-N-T. This is a noun from 1783. We just have the synonym catkin. C-A-T-K-I-N. Amentiferous is an adjective. The etymology says this is from Latin amentum, which means thong or strap. I feel like I've heard the word catkin before, uh, but I'm not thinking of what it is, so I guess we'll just wait until we get to the seas to find out what that is. Next we have amentia. A-M-E-N-T-I-A. This is a noun from the 14th century. We have the synonym uh, mental retardation, which I'm not sure if that's the proper uh, term anymore. Specifically, a condition of lack of development of intellectual capacity. Sometimes I feel like I have that. Looks like this is a Latin word that means madness. It's from amentamens, A-M-E-N-T, a-M-E-N-S, which means mad. And it's from mens, which means mind. And there's more at the word mind. Next, we have capital A-M-E-R. This is an abbreviation for America or American. Next is Amerasian. Capital A-M-E-R-A-S-I-A-N. I have a thought of what this might be, but I don't want to embarrass myself, though, so let's just read the definition. Uh, It's from 1953. A person of mixed American and Asian descent, especially one fathered by an American and especially an American serviceman in Asia. Clearly, it doesn't have to be that specific, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess anybody who is part American, which is a very vague term, Uh, and part Asian could be considered Amerasian. Uh, This might be one of those words that probably doesn't get used very much anymore. Um, It might be a little derogatory. I haven't heard of it, to my knowledge. Maybe I did a long time ago, but I don't retain everything. Like, I'm probably retaining 0.1% of this book. All right, moving on, we have Immerse. 
A-M-E-R-C-E. I think that's how it's pronounced. This is a transitive verb from the 15th century. To punish by a fine whose amount is fixed by the court. Broadly, we have the synonym punish. Immersement is a noun, and immersiable or immersible uh, is an adjective. A-M-E-R-C-I-A-B-L-E. Next, we have the word American with a capital A. It's the first form. This is a noun from 1568. It's interesting that the word came uh, that long ago. One, an American Indian of North America or South America. Well, when you put it in those terms, then yeah, it makes sense why uh, it's such an old word. Two, a native or inhabitant of North America or South America. Three, a citizen of the U.S. Four, we have the synonym American English. Now we have the second form of the word American. This is an adjective from 1580. One, of or relating to America. Two, of or relating to the U.S. or its possessions or original territory. Americanness is a noun. Next and final word for this episode is Americana, capital A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N-A. This is a noun from 1841. One, materials concerning or characteristic of America, its civilization, or its culture. Broadly, things typical of America. Some of those things probably shouldn't exist anymore. Two, American culture. Three, a genre of American music having roots in early folk and country music. I think the idea of America, American, uh, and maybe to an extent Americana, it, it's, it's something that gets debated a lot. Uh, I think a lot of people disagree on this. I've probably talked about this in the past. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have, so I won't talk about it too much here. But um, real quick, I just want to say that the to me, the idea of being American or living in America is all about inclusivity. America was made, if you start from when Europeans came over, uh, it was made from immigrants. People have been coming to America for hundreds of years, and that is what America is today. We took the land from the Native Americans, or another term would be the American Indians. Uh, they were here, and we screwed that up. It's in the past. We need to respect them and respect their heritage and fix that as much as we can. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to go back to them running this land, that's just impossible at this point. Um, but if we can get everybody on board to realize that we are a nation of immigrants, that what that is what makes America, literally, then hopefully we can get some people on board with that idea. Because we are all immigrants, except for the Native Americans. Every single one of us, whether we were born here or not, is from an immigrant. My family came over in the 1630s, but we came over from another country. We weren't born here. This is something I feel passionate about. I just hate it when when people are trying to get rid of immigrants, and it, it's just insane. Um, you know, I don't want any country, any area to be overpopulated, but at the same time, you know, there are so many laws that allow people to be free here in this country, which unfortunately there are some that are going away, which we need to fix. Um, but there are reasons people want to come here and we need to be accepting of that. So that's all I'll say about that. That's my two cents. And I will leave it at that. I'm going to stop recording for today because I have finished page 39. And as you guessed, Next time, we will be on page 40. That's it for me for today. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Is there anything interesting to talk about today? Uh, let's see. I recently got the four episodes from my friends in England. 
uh, and I edited them. They will be dropping on July 14th through 17th. So a few days after this episode drops, uh, you will start to hear some other voices, and then it will go back to mine. I'm using a, a different microphone today. I, uh, I just want to sort of switch back and forth to see which ones sound best. I'm, I'm not a microphone expert. They're very different. Uh, this one seems a little weird to me, but I think for podcasting, it's supposed to be better. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see if you have any strong opinions. Let me know. Contact info uh, is in the episode details area. There's some links there. And of course, if you want to give me your money so I can do this forever and ever, please do that. There's a Patreon link. All right. First word for this episode is American Chameleon. Two words. American is capitalized. I'm going to be saying the word American for every single word or phrase or whatever this episode and probably half or more in the next episode. So get ready for that. All right. American chameleon is a noun from 1881. An anole or anole, don't know of the pronunciation, of the southeastern U.S. that can vary its skin color from green to brown and is often kept as a pet. The scientific name is Anolis carolinensis. There's a picture of an American chameleon. It's a black and white drawing, and it just looks like a lizard with a big thing under its neck. Next we have American cheese. This is a noun from 1763. A process cheese made from American cheddar. If you talk to some cheese connoisseurs, they would probably tell you that this is the most gross and processed nasty cheese around. I'm not a cheese connoisseur, but I'm aware that this is some pretty low quality stuff. Next we have American dog tick, a noun from 1927, a common North American Exoded tick, especially of dogs and humans, that is an important vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia, also called dog tick. The scientific name is Dermacentor or Dermacentor variabilis. I think I've heard for ticks, uh, if you put some fire near them, that will get them to let go of your skin. If you've already got it um, under your skin, I don't know, you're screwed. But yeah, this is uh, one of those things that it's probably good to learn how to deal with them, how to spot them. Uh, so if you're going to be in the outdoors, in the woods, whatever, go look up how to deal with ticks. I think they probably have some good tips and tricks. I'm having rhymes come out of my mouth, and I can't think of something that rhymes with mouth. Next is American Dream. This is a noun. The D is often capitalized. It's from 1931, an American social ideal that stresses egalitarianism and especially material prosperity, also the prosperity or life that is the realization of this ideal. I like the egalitarianism idea because I, uh, from what I understand, that's uh, meaning everybody's equal. Doesn't really seem like we have that in this country. If you stop to think about it, you don't even need to stop and think that hard. We are not particularly egalitarianism. Again, if I'm understanding the word correctly, uh, we have a lot of people who are really, really rich and we have a lot of people, way more people who are really, really poor. Uh, that does not seem equal to me. Um, also, material prosperity, while I understand that's what the American dream is, I, I don't know, I just have some issues with that ideal. I think we need to be more equal and less about material stuff. My wife and I are trying to get rid of our stuff, and we don't need it. It's just junk, and it's going to fill up the junkyards and the garbage dumps and it's such a waste we i think we all need to live a bit more simply in life we don't need things if this is the first time you're listening to an episode uh yeah sometimes i bring up my personal feelings about stuff so if you don't like that 
sorry. I try not to do it too often or try not to talk about things too uh, lengthy, but uh, I do have thoughts, and I'm going through a lot of words here, so there's a lot of stuff that gets brought up. Next, we have American eel. This is a noun from 1923. A yellow to greenish brown catadromous eel that is lighter below, has 103 to 111 vertebrae, is found in fresh and coastal waters along the Atlantic coasts of North America, and is held to spawn in or near the Sargossa Sea. Where's the Sargossa Sea, you might ask? I might tell you I don't know, because that is the truth. I would have to go look it up on a map, and so would you. The scientific name is Anguilla rostrata. Pronunciation might be a little bit off there. I wonder why it has 103 to 111 vertebrae. Are there slightly different species of American eel, and some have more and some have less vertebrae? Don't know. Maybe sometimes they're just born with a slightly different amount of vertebrae. Next is American elm, E-L-M. This is a noun from 1785. A large elm with gradually spreading branches and pendulous branchlets that is common in eastern North America. They're also common in the Midwest, because that's where I grew up, and I still live, and I was born on the street called Elmwood. There used to be a bunch of elm trees there, but they all had to be cut down because of Dutch elm disease. I'm pretty sure none of them are left. Next we have American English, what I am speaking to you now. This is a noun from 1805. The English language, as spoken in the U.S., used especially with the implication that it is clearly distinguishable from British English, yet not so divergent as to be a separate language. That makes sense, but I have a feeling that the people in 1805 had no idea what American English would end up being like, and if they were to hear it today, they would probably be rolling over in their graves. Next we have Americanese. A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N-E-S-E. -E. This is a noun from 1870, and we just have the synonym American English. Next is American Foxhound, a noun from circa 1891. Any of a breed of foxhounds developed in the U.S. that are smaller than the English foxhound, but with longer ears and a short, glossy coat, usually of black, tan, and white. Next is American Indian. The people our ancestors slaughtered. This is a noun from 1732. A member of any of the aboriginal peoples of the Western Hemisphere, except often the Eskimos, especially an American Indian of North America and especially the U.S., compared to the word Native American. American Indian is also an adjective. Next we have Americanization or Americanize. Both of those have S's, so they are the British variations of Americanization and Americanize with Z's. That's how it's spelled in American English. Next is Americanism. This has an I-S-M at the end. This is a noun from 1781. One, a characteristic feature of American English, especially as contrasted with British English. Two, attachment or allegiance to the traditions, interests, or ideals of the U.S. Three, a, a custom or trait peculiar to America. Three, b, the political principles and practices essential to American culture. Next is Americanist, with an I-S-T at the end. This is a noun from 1881. 1. A specialist in American culture or history. 2. A specialist in the languages or cultures of the aboriginal inhabitants of America. Next and last word for this episode, Americanization. A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. This is a noun from 1853. 1. The act or process of Americanizing. 2. Instruction for foreigners, as immigrants, 
in English and in U.S. history, government, and culture. That will end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I'm still trying to figure out what an end tag could be, so if you have any suggestions, please tweet me, email me, Facebook me, whatever. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Word nerds, that's you. I'm talking to you. I wonder how you're doing. Should we get to the words? All right, let's do it. We have more American words, as promised. First word for today is Americanize. A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N-I-Z-E. And, of course, uh, which I did not mention before, all of these start with a capital A. This is a verb from 1797. One, to cause to acquire or conform to American characteristics. Two, to bring, as an area, under the political, cultural, or commercial influence of the U.S. That was the transitive definitions. Here we have the intransitive definition. To acquire or conform to American traits. Next we have American Pit Bull Terrier. This is a noun from 1950. Any of a breed of dogs developed to combine the traits of terriers and bulldogs that have extremely powerful jaws and great strength and tenacity and that were originally bred for dogfighting, called also Pit Bull Terrier. Next we have American Plan. This is a noun from 1852. A hotel plan whereby the daily rates cover the costs of the room and three meals, compared to the European plan. Ooh, I wonder what that is. Next we have American Saddlebred. S-A-D-D-L-E-B-R-E-D. No, it's not the bread that you eat. This is a noun from 1948. Any of a breed of three-gated or five-gated saddle horses developed chiefly in Kentucky from thoroughbreds and smooth-gated stock, called also American Saddle Horse. Next, we have American Shad, S-H-A-D. This is a noun from circa 1929. A shad of the Atlantic coast of North America that has a greenish back and silvery sides. I think this might be a fish. I don't know fish. I don't go fishing, so I'm not sure. But I feel like a shad might be a fish. The scientific name is Alosa sapidissima. Next, we have American short hair. This is a noun from 1974. Any of a breed of cats with a short, thick coat of variable color and pattern that are descended from cats brought to America by European settlers. Next is American Sign Language. First letter of each is capitalized. This is a noun from 1960. A sign language for the deaf in which meaning is conveyed by a system of articulated hand gestures and their placement relative to the upper body. My sister is actually a sign language interpreter. She's been doing that for many years and is very good at it from what I can tell. I took one sign language class uh, when I was a senior in high school. Uh, I know the alphabet, maybe a couple of words, but uh, it didn't really sink in. But I do like it. It's a very good language to learn, especially if you can't hear somebody. You know, if you're in a situation that's really loud and you still want to talk, like at a bar or a concert, why would you want to be talking at a concert? That's not really normal. But if you do, you can use some sign language. Next is American Staffordshire Terrier. Staffordshire, I think is pronounced correctly. It's spelled capital S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D. S-H-I-R-E. This is a noun from 1971. Any of a breed of strong, stocky dogs that are of similar ancestry to, but are larger and heavier than the related American Pit Bull Terrier and Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Next, we have American Standard Version. First letter is capitalized in each of the three words. This is a noun from 1901 an American version of the Bible based on the revised version and published in 1901, called also American Revised Version. Next, we have American Trotter, 
T-R-O-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E this is a noun from 1857, and we just have the synonym standard bread. All one word. Again, you don't eat it. It's B-R-E-D. Next is American Water Spaniel. This is a noun from 1947. Any of a breed of medium-sized spaniels of the U.S. origin that have a thick, curly chocolate or liver-colored coat. Liver-colored? You couldn't come up with a different color for that? What's liver-colored? Is it kind of green-brown? That's sort of what I imagine it to be. I don't know if I've ever seen a liver in person, but I think I've seen it cooked. Mostly brown is what I'm thinking with maybe a, a tinge of green. But seriously, there's got to be a better word than liver colored. Next, we have American Widgeon. Widgeon is spelled like pigeon with a W. W-I-G-E-O-N. This is a noun from 1788. A North American Widgeon with a large white patch on each wing and in the male, a white crown. Called also bald pate. Bald pate? B-A-L-D-P-A-T-E, all one word. The scientific name is Anas Americana. I'm wondering if this is related to a pigeon, and that's why the names are so similar. Now I want to see a picture of a widgeon. All right, we are getting away from the words that start with American, but this next one is uh, still pretty similar. This one is Americium, A-M-E-R-I-C-I-U-M. This is a noun from 1946, a radioactive metallic element produced artificially by bombarding plutonium with high-energy neutrons. And then it says to see the element table. Next we have Amerind, capital A-M-E-R-I-N-D. This is an abbreviation for American Indian. I've never heard that abbreviation before. But we have something similar. It is Amer Indian. So it's Amer, A M E R, from American, and the whole word Indian. And they are combined into one word. This is a noun from circa 1898. We have the synonym American Indian. And then it says Amerind. The word we just read is a noun or an adjective. And Amerindian is also an adjective. Next we have Amislan. Capital A-M-E-S-L-A-N. This is a noun from 1972. We have the synonym American Sign Language. I'll have to ask my sister if she's heard that, uh, that word, that shortened version. She probably has. Next we have Ames Test. Capital A-M-E-S. Next word test. T-E-S-T. -E this is a noun from 1976 a test for identifying potential carcinogens by studying their mutagenic effect on bacteria. This is from Bruce N. Ames. He was born in 1928, and he was an American biochemist. Next, we have the word amethyst, A-M-E-T-H-Y-S-T. -E this is a noun from the 13th century, 1A, a clear purple or bluish violet variety of crystallized quartz that is often used as a jeweler's stone. 1b, a deep purple variety of corundum, C-O-R-U-N-D-U-M. 2, a moderate purple. Amethystin is an adjective and it is spelled A-M-E-T-H-Y-S-T-I-N-E. The etymology is pretty interesting. This is from the Greek amethystos, which literally means a remedy against drunkenness. That is made by combining A plus methien, M-E-T-H-Y-E-I-N, which means to be drunk. Uh, that is from the word methi, which means wine, and there's more at the word mead. So, what... Mead and amethyst are related uh, etymologically. W why? Why does amethyst come from remedy against drunkenness? What, what happened there? Ooh, you know what I just learned about today? 
somebody made an etymology dictionary website.、Uh, so I'm going to have to look up this word and to see if it describes how it evolved from a remedy against drunkenness to a, a purple. What's maybe if I knew what corundum was, that might help.、Uh, but I'm not. Other than that, I'm not seeing anything that relates to alcohol whatsoever. I find that really interesting. All right, next and last word for this episode is amitropia. A M E T R O P I A. This is a noun from 1875. An abnormal refractive condition, as myopia, hyperopia. Or astigmatism of the eye, in which images fail to focus upon the retina. I said astigmatism weird because I wasn't looking at the whole word,、uh, and it just came out funny. I actually have astigmatism. I have a very slight case of it,、uh, so you know my glasses adjust for that. When I first started hearing about astigmatism, I always heard it wrong. I thought it was. A thing that you have, not a condition you have. So I wanted people to say, "I have an astigmatism," because I thought it was a noun; it was a thing.、Uh, but when I learned that it's just astigmatism, it's a condition, then you can say, "I have astigmatism." Anyway, enough of that. Amitropic is an adjective, and let's look at the etymology. It says it comes from Greek amitros, which means without measure. And there's more at the word measure. All right, that's going to end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Of course, as usual, I am your host, Spencer.、Uh, before we begin, I have、uh, some news. My wife and her very, very good friend are starting their own podcast.、Uh, Once everything is up, we've got a one or two episodes uploaded. I will let you know. I will put links、uh, in my episode description. But if you are a fan of horror movies and ghost stories, the paranormal, true crime, that sort of stuff,、uh, you will probably like this.、Uh, and with that, let's get to the words. It's been a number of days since I recorded,、uh, so it's a little weird getting back into this. Uh, but things have been busy, and part of that has been、uh, helping them with their podcast. All right, first for today is AMG, all caps. This is an abbreviation for Allied Military Government. Next we have Amharic. It is spelled capital A M H A R I C. It looks like it can be pronounced a couple of other ways too.、Uh, Amharic, Amharic. Something like that. This is a noun from 1813, a Semitic language that is an official language of Ethiopia. Amharic is also an adjective. Next we have amiable. This is an adjective from the 14th century. One is archaic. We have the synonyms pleasing and admirable. Two a generally agreeable. As in an amiable comedy, to be, being friendly, sociable, and congenial. Amiability is a noun. Amiableness is also a noun, and amiably is an adverb. Here we have some synonym information: amiable, good-natured, obliging, complacent, mean having the desire or disposition to please. Amiable implies having qualities that make one liked and easy to deal with, as in an amiable teacher not easily annoyed. Good-natured implies cheerfulness or helpfulness, and sometimes a willingness to be imposed upon, as in a good-natured girl who is always willing to pitch in. Obliging stresses a friendly readiness to be helpful. As in our obliging innkeeper found us a bigger room. Ooh, it is so good when a hotel or whatever、uh, will get you a nicer, bigger room for the same cost.、Mm. Complacent often implies passivity or a yielding to others because of weakness. As in, was too complacent 
to protest a decision he thought unfair. The etymology says this is from uh, Latin amicabilis, which means friendly, uh, also from the Latin amicus, which means friend, and that is akin to the Latin amare, which means to love. Next we have amicable. This is an adjective from the 15th century, characterized by friendly goodwill. Synonym is peaceable, P-E-A-C-E, a-B-L-E. I don't think I realized peaceable was a word. Amicability is a noun. Amicableness is also a noun. And amicably is an adverb very similar to uh, the, the other forms that we read in amiable. We have some synonym information for amicable too. Amicable, neighborly, friendly mean exhibiting goodwill and an absence of antagonism. Amicable implies a state of peace and a desire on the part of the parties not to quarrel, as in maintained amicable relations. Neighborly implies a disposition to live on good terms with others and to be helpful on principle, as in neighborly concern. Friendly stresses cordiality and often warmth or intimacy of personal relations as in sought friendly advice. Next we have amice, A-M-I-C-E. This is a noun from the 13th century, a liturgical vestment made of an oblong piece of cloth, usually of white linen and worn about the neck and shoulders and partly under the alb. I'm sure I read the word alb, but I don't remember what the definition says. The etymology says this is from the Middle Latin amictus, uh, which means cloak. It's from amicire, which means to wrap around. And that is uh, from am or amb, which means around, plus jacere, which means to throw. And there's more at the prefix ambi, which uh, we've read, or also the word jet, J-E-T. Next, we have amicus. I thought it was amicus. A-M-I-C-U-S. This is a noun from 1951. We just have the synonym. This looks uh, Latin or Italian. Uh, amicus curiae, which, by the way, is our next phrase. And yes, it is Latin. Now let's see if I can uh, find out how to pronounce it correctly. Curiae. Yep, amicus curiae. A-M-I-C-U-S. Next word, C-U-R-I-A-E. This is a noun from 1612. One, as a professional person or organization that is not a party to a particular litigation, but that is permitted by the court to advise it in respect to some matter of law that directly affects the case in question. And uh, yes, this is New Latin, literally means friend of the court. And I think we will do uh, one more word for this episode, amid, A-M-I-D, or also amidst, A-M-I-D-S-T. This is a preposition from before the 12th century, so it's a very old English word. One, in or into the middle of, surrounded by. Among is a synonym, as in amid the crowd. 2A, we have the synonym during, as in amid the fighting. 2B, with the accompaniment of, as in resigned amid rumors of misconduct. So it looks like that is going to end this episode. I am still looking for a uh, phrase to say at the end. The easiest one I could think of was keep on learning or don't stop learning, uh, but that's super cheesy. So, if you have something better, let me know. Contact info is in the uh, episode description, the details. And of course, as usual, please rate and review. Five stars, please. Nothing less than that, of course. Uh, There's a Patreon. Share this. Tell your friends that there's some idiot recording himself uh, reading the entire dictionary. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds! Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Are you getting sick of me saying that? 
I'm kind of getting sick of saying it, but I'm going to keep on doing it because I have told myself that I'm going to read this whole dictionary and record it and give it to you. First word for this episode is amadaze, A-M-I-D-A-S-E. This is a noun from 1921. An enzyme that hydrolyzes acid amides, usually with the liberation of ammonia. Next we have amide, A-M-I-D-E. This is a noun from 1838. 1. An inorganic compound derived from ammonia by replacement of an atom of hydrogen with another element as a metal. 2. Any of a class of organic compounds derived from ammonia or an amine by replacement of hydrogen with an acyl group. Compared to the words amine and imide. Uh, Amine is A-M-I-N-E which we will get to shortly, and imide is I-M-I-D-E. Next we have amido, A-M-I-D-O. This is an adjective from 1877. Yes, more scientific words. Relating to or containing an organic amide group, often used in combination. Next we have amidships, A-M-I-D, S-H-I-P-S. This is an adverb from 1692. 1. In or toward the part of a ship midway between bow and stern. 2. In or toward the middle. Next is amigo, A-M-I-G-O. This is definitely not an English word, but we have, uh, I guess, taken it. Taken it under our wing and called it our own, even though it's not. This is a noun from 1835. It just has the synonym friend because this is a Spanish word which is from Latin amicus or amicus uh, and there's more at the word amiable which we've read. Next we have amine or amine. No, it's amine. A-M-I-N-E. I read this earlier uh, for amide where it says compared to amine but I pronounced it incorrectly. I'm sure all of you science people heard that and your ears just freaked out. All right, this is a noun from 1863. Any of a class of basic organic compounds derived from ammonia by replacement of hydrogen with one or more monovalent hydrocarbon radicals compared to amide 2. Next we have amino, A-M-I-N-O. Can somebody be an amino amigo? This is an adjective from 1900. I thought it said 1990. No, 1900. Relating to being or containing an amine group. No, amine group. Often used in combination. Next we have amino acid. A noun from 1898. An amphoteric organic acid containing the amino group NH2, especially any of the various amino acids having the amino group in the alpha position that are the chief components of proteins and are synthesized by living cells or are obtained as essential components of the diet. Whew, that was a mouthful. Next, we have a fun word, amino aciduria. A-M-I-N-O. A-C-I-D-U-R-I-A. This is all one word. It's a noun from circa 1923. A condition in which one or more amino acids are excreted in excessive amounts. Next is amino benzoic acid. Amino, B-E-N-Z-O-I-C. Next word, acid. Amino benzoic is one word. This is a noun from 1904. Any of three crystalline derivatives, C7H7NO2, of benzoic acid. Especially, we have the synonym para-aminobenzoic acid. Next is aminopeptidase, all one word, A-M-I-N-O-P-E-P-T-I-D-A-S-E. This is a noun from 1935 an enzyme that hydrolyzes peptides by acting on the peptide bond next to a terminal amino acid containing a free 
amino group. What I've noticed with these scientific words uh, often is that once you get one, you get a bunch of them uh, because they all have a very similar uh, prefix. Next, we have aminophylline, uh, give or take the pronunciation. I'm not exactly sure on the last uh, couple of vowels. A-M-I-N-O-P-H-Y-L-L-I-N-E. Aminophylline? Aminophylline. Amina, uh, whatever. Uh, this is a noun from 1934. A theophylline derivative, C16H24N10O4, used especially to stimulate the heart in congestive heart failure and to dilate the air passages in respiratory disorders as asthma. Next, we have um, aminopterin. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's spelled like amino pterin, uh, but that's not how it's pronounced. A M I N O P T E R I N. Aminopterin. And the uh, previous word was probably aminophilin. I think that's how it's pronounced. So, aminopterin is a noun from 1948. A derivative, C 19 H 20 N 8 O 5 of glutamic acid that is a folic acid antagonist and has been used in a rodenticide, rodenticide, yep, that's the thing that kills rodents, and anti-leukemic agent. Anti-leukemic is A-N-T-I-L-E-U-K-E-M-I-C. Next we have aminopyrene, A-M-I-N-O-P-Y-R-I-N-E. It's a bunch of long vowels. Aminopyrene. This is a noun from circa 1936. A crystalline compound, C13H17N3O, formerly used to relieve pain and fever, but now largely abandoned for this purpose because of the occurrence of fatal granulocytosis as a side effect in some users. This definition is a little bit different from most of the ones we uh, see because the usage of this uh, drug, chemical, whatever it is, crystalline compound, has changed over the years. Uh, so it's, it says it's different, and it actually says why. So I find that kind of interesting. Next, we have aminosalicylic acid. I think I read a word similar to this in the past. A-M-I-N-O... S-A-L-I-C-Y-L-I-C, -I -I and then the word acid. Aminosalicylic acid. I think I did something like that then. Uh, all right, this is a noun from 1925. Any of four isometric derivatives, C7H7NO3, of salicylic acid that have a single amino group, especially para-aminosalicylic acid. All right, just a few more for this episode. This one is aminotransferase. A-M-I-N-O-T-R-A-N-S-F-E-R-A-S-E. -E. This is a noun from circa 1965. We just have the synonym transaminase. T-R-A-N-S-A-M-I-N-A-S-E. All right, next we have amir, A-M-I-R. It's a variation of emir, E-M-I-R. Uh, the pronunciation of both of those was probably a little bit weird, but it doesn't actually tell me how to pronounce them. All right, last word for this episode is Amish, capital A-M-I-S-H. This is an adjective from 1844. Uh, that is odd because we will uh, look at the etymology in a moment of or relating to a strict sect of Mennonites who were followers of Amman, A-M-M-A-N, and settled in America chiefly in the 18th century, which is the 1700s. Uh, and Amish is also a noun. Uh, so now I know why they're called Amish, because they followed Amman. They're sort of Amish. The etymology says uh, this is probably from the German Amish, uh, A-M-I-S-C-H, which is from Jacob Amman, or 
Amen, A-M-E-N. It could have been spelled either way. Uh, and it looks like he was from 1693. It says F-L. Is that when, uh, what is that? What is F-L? Flourished? Fluvenated? No, I'm not sure what 1693 in this case is. But then it says Swiss Mennonite bishop. Uh, maybe that's when he became a Swiss Mennonite bishop. But so it's interesting that the word Amish came in 1844, uh, but the group was actually created probably at least uh, 40 to 50 years before that. And that is all I have to say about Amish and this set of words for this episode. That's all I got. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Uh, So for this episode and the next three episodes, we have guest readers, uh, and they are actually the only readers uh, in the episode. I won't be saying anything except right now uh, and the end, probably. Uh, But uh, there are people I know who live in England, and they were actually pretty excited to help out with this project. Uh, So they went ahead and recorded these four episodes on their own, and... uh, yeah, they, the, obviously the audio quality is going to be a little bit different, uh, but more importantly, their accents are different than mine. So if you are British of any kind, English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, uh, their accents will probably feel a bit more comforting to you than my ridiculous American accent. Uh, so here we go with Chris and his first episode. Good evening, Word Nerds. My name is Chris. I'm in the UK. I'm from the UK, as you can probably tell. I know Spencer uh, through my wife, Kate, who's from Chicago. Hey! There she is. And I really love words, so I'm absolutely looking forward to doing this. Um, I have a slight lisp, so apologies for any um, lazy S sounds. Okay, our first word is a miss in its first meaning. It's an adverb from the 13th century. Meaning 1A, in a mistaken way synonymous with wrongly. For example, if you think he is guilty, you judge amiss. 1b, astray, as in something had gone amiss. And the second meaning in this sense is in a faulty way, imperfectly. Our second version of amiss is an adjective. This adjectival version is from the 14th century. It means 1. Not being in accordance with right order. 2. Faulty or imperfect. 3. Out of place in given circumstances, usually used with a negative. For example, a few remarks may not be amiss here. Our next word is amitosis. It's a noun, New Latin, um, via French, uh, from 1894. It's about cell division. (laughs) For all those cell division fans out there. Cell division by simple... Cell division by simple cleavage of the nucleus and division of the cytoplasm without spindle formation or appearance of chromosomes. Uh, So sorry, anyone who enjoys spindle formation. (laughs) As you can tell, I giggled with the word cleavage there. Uh, Amitotic is an adjective linked to that, and amitotically is the linked adverb. There we go. I'm still grinning. Our next word is amitriptyline. Amitriptyline. Uh, it comes from amino and tritophan. Uh, a tricyclic aromatic antidepressant drug, C20H23N, for those of you who love chemistry, used in the form of its hydrochloride salt. Our next word is amitrol. Amitrol. Um, this comes from around 1960. A systemic herbicide, C2H4N4, used in areas other than food croplands. Croplands isn't a word you come across much. Next word, amity. Uh, Plural amities, of course. From Middle English, amite, French, um, amite, and so on and so forth. Uh, Originally from Latin amicus for friend. Uh, This stems from the 15th century. It means friendship, especially friendly relations between nations. That's very lyrical. Friendly relations between nations. That's amity. And now we move on to amateur. Uh, from ampere and meter, as in something that measures stump, uh, something. From 1882, an instrument for measuring electric current, especially in amperes. Our next word is amine. A-double-M-I-N-E, amine. 
um, as in linked to ammonia. This one's from 1897. It's a molecule of ammonia as it exists in a coordination complex. Uh, for example, hexammonine cobalt chloride. Oh, blimey heck. COMH3 six CL3, for those of you listening along at home. <laughs> in its second meaning, it is a compound that contains an amine. There we go. Next word is ammo. Now, unsurprisingly, this noun is uh, formed by shortening and altering ammunition. It stems from about 1911, so just predating the First World War. Next word, ammonia. From New Latin, sal ammoniacus. Uh, literally the salt of Ammon, from the Greek Ammonikos of Ammon, and so on and so forth. Uh, stems all the way back to Ammon, an Egyptian god near whose temple at the Siwa oasis it was extracted. This one stems from 1789, so I guess that's around the time um, Napoleon was thrusting into Egypt. Uh, meaning one, a pungent, colourless, gaseous, alkaline compound of nitrogen and hydrogen, NH3, that is very soluble in water and can easily be condensed to a liquid by cold and pressure. Two, second meaning, ammonia water. There we go. Uh, we then have the next word, ammoniac. This stems originally from French and Greek. Again, it's linked to ammon. This is from the 15th century, the aromatic gum resin of a Southwest Asian herb. Durima, the Latin name Durima ammoniacum, Durima ammoniacum, of the carrot family, used as, as an expectorant and stimulant and in plasters. We then have ammoniacal, also ammoniac or ammoniac. Uh, this comes from about 1646. And unsurprisingly, this is an adjective of relating to, containing, or resembling ammonia. Moving swiftly on, next word is ammoniate. Um, it's a transitive verb uh, from around 1928. Its first meaning is to combine or impregnate with ammonia or an ammonium compound. Its second meaning is to subject to ammonification. And that also gives us the word ammoniation, um, which is, of course, the noun version of that process. Next up, ammonia water. It's a noun from 1852, and unsurprisingly, it is a water solution of ammonia. Predictably, here we have ammonification. This one comes from 1886. The act or process of ammoniating. Also, second meaning, decomposition with production of ammonia or ammonium compounds, especially by the action of bacteria on nitrogenous organic matter. See also, ammonify the verb. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed that word, nerds. Cheerio. Thank you very much, Chris, for that lovely reading of one quarter of page 41. And uh, that will end this episode. Looking forward to hearing your next episode. I've already heard it, but the people haven't. So they are looking forward to hearing it. And until next time, this is Spencer and Chris reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Good evening, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Today, we have another guest reader, except it's not another guest reader. It's the same guest reader as yesterday. It's Chris reading the second quarter of page 41. Uh, you will hear his voice one more time uh, in this uh, short set of guest readers, uh, but he was very excited to do this. Uh, so we will probably have him back in the future. All right, Chris, take it away. Hello, word nerds. I've been cautioned that I'm not to say good evening on this one, because, of course, it might not be evening where you're listening <laughs> on a podcast at any time of the day. Hello, it's Chris again from the UK. And I hope there's a lot of chemistry fans out there for this episode, uh, because we're, <laughs> we're hitting the ammonium pretty hard. Uh, so, this time uh, we're, we're straight in with the first of two versions of the word ammonite. Ammonite, yep, yeah, that's right. This is the common noun version of it uh, from New Latin. Uh, literally, uh, a, uh, a version of cornu am ammonis, 
the Horn of Ammon, 1758 this comes from, any of a subclass, Ammonidae, of extinct cephalopods, especially abundant in the Mesozoic age that had flat spiral shells with the interior divided by scepter into chambers. Ammonitic, Ammonitic. Those are the adjectival versions for those of you who, <laughs> those of you who love your extinct cephalopods. See, I trailed this by saying this was a great one for the chemists, but really we've gone into biology um, straight away. However, for those of you who love your Bible studies, we also have Ammonite in its proper noun version with a capital A, A W M O N I T E, Ammonite, um, from the Hebrew Ammon the son of Lot, uh, descendant of Ammon. That's useful. Uh, this usage comes from 1530, a member of a Semitic people who, in Old Testament times, lived east of the Jordan between the Jabbok and the Arnon. Um, and we also have, with the noun form, the nominal form Ammonite, we have the identical adjectival form Ammonite. There you go. Should you need... <laughs> Should you need to use a variety of uh, Ammonite words, word nerds, you've got a, a cornucopia of them. Oh, like cornuamonis, the horn of Ammon, the shape of that uh, Mesozoic cephalopod we were talking about just now. <laughs> I remember those times. Right, next up, we have the word ammonium. And stand by, because there's got to be a lot of this. This is a noun um, from the New Latin via French, ammonia, 1808, an ion, NH4+, plus, derived from ammonia by a combination with a hydrogen ion and known in compounds as salts that resemble in properties the compounds of the alkali metals. I got nothing. Next one, ammonia carbonate. Uh, this is another noun. It comes from around 1829. And... Ammonia, ammonium carbonate, unsurprisingly, is a carbonate of, an ammon of ammonium. Uh, specifically, the commercial mixture of the bicarbonate and carbamate used, especially in smelling salts. For all you uh, fainting heroines out there. Next up, we have ammonium chloride. Guess where we're going with this? It's 1869, a white crystalline volatile salt, NH4Cl, that is used in dry cells and as an expectorant, called also sal ammoniac. Our next word is ammonium cyanate. This one is another noun, it comes from around 1881. They loved their ammonium experiments in the late 1800s. It's important that this is remembered. And ammonium cyanate <laughs> is an inorganic white crystalline salt, NH4CNO, that can be converted into organic urea. I'm sure that smells vile. Uh, next word, word nerds, is ammonium hydroxide. Firm family favourite in 1899. This noun is a weakly basic compound, NH4OH, that is formed when ammonia dissolves in water and it exists only in solution. Next word, ammonium nitrate, 1869. This noun is a colourless crystalline salt, NH4NO3, used in explosives and fertilisers and in vet veterinary medicine. So if you want to either heal poorly animals or blow people up with a nail bomb, this is the choice for you. Next word, ammonium phosphate. It's a noun. It's from the 1880s. It says here 1880, sorry. A phosphate of ammonium, especially diammonium phosphate. That tells us lots. Next up. Ammonium sulfate, 1869, a colourless crystalline salt, NH4-2SO4, used chiefly as a fertiliser. Our next word, word nerds, is ammonoid. This one's from 1884, and it is synonymous with ammonite. Um, so even though it's got the oid ending there, it's a noun, and it's, uh, yeah, it's another, it's another way of saying Mesozoic ammonite. Ammunition, this is a noun. Uh, obscure French ammunition from Middle French, altar of, uh, an alternative of munition. It's been extended from the core word munition in Middle French. 
So around 1607, this one is first recorded by the look of it, in its first meaning, the projectiles, so this is meaning 1A, sorry, the projectiles with their fuses, propelling charges or primers are fired from guns. 1B, cartridges, similar to the above. 1C, explosive military items, brackets as grenades or bombs. Second meaning, and here we go into the metaphorical or figurative interpretation, material for use in attacking or defending a position. Uh, example, ammunition for the defence lawyers. That's splendid, ammunition for the defence lawyers. Next one is an abbreviation, and it's AMN, capital A, lowercase m, lowercase n, and it's the abbreviation for airman. Try pronouncing that when you're drunk. Next word is Amnesia. It's New Latin from Greek amnesia, forgetfulness. Alternative or for amnestia. Now this word came in around 1618. It's first recorded. Uh, its first meaning is a loss of memory due usually to brain injury, shock, fatigue, repression or illness. Second meaning is a gap in one's memory. The third meaning is the selective overlooking or ignoring of events or acts that are not favourable or useful to one's purposes or position. So again, that sort of extended metaphorical meaning. And we have, of course, um, amnesiac in its adjectival or nominal form, or, or amnesic, um, to describe or label someone or something who is in that state. Our next word is amnesty plural amnesties, I-E-S, uh, from Greek for forgetfulness, uh, via a bunch of French words, uh, meaning to remember. And this one stems from 1580, the act of an authority, as in a government, uh, by which pardon is granted to, the, to a large group of individuals. Amnesty. Uh, and one can also use it as a transitive verb. Next word we have is amnio. This is a noun, forming its plural, amnios. This comes from 1983, and it links to everyone's favourite, amniocentesis. And guess where we're going now, word nerds? That's right, amniocentesis. It's a noun. Plurals are amniocentesis. It comes from, via, via French and New Latin, amnion plus centesis puncture and so on and so forth, from the Greek word to prick. Um, this comes from 1957, the surgical insertion of a hollow needle through the abdominal wall and into the uterus to obtain amniotic fluid, especially for the determination of fetal sex or chromosomal abnormality. Amniocentesis. Our last word for this episode, and thank you for your patience, is amnion. The plural being formed with either amnions or amnia. Uh, from, ooh, this is interesting, from the French, uh, New Latin, French, Greek, call, uh, from Amnos Lamb. Oh, like the call, like being born in a call. Oh, that's fascinating. Our second born was born in a call. Um, so this meaning one, a thin membrane forming a closed sac about the embryos or fetuses of reptiles birds and mammals and containing the amniotic fluid. The second meaning is a membrane analogous to the amnion and occurring in various invertebrates. And we have the adjectival form here, amniotic. And at this point, I leave you. Thank you for listening if you have been. Bye-bye, word nerds. Thank you so much for that lovely reading again. And uh, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Thank you very much. Hello, word nerds. Yes, we are here with another episode. Uh, in this episode, you will not hear Chris. Uh, you've heard him the last uh, couple of episodes. But this time, you will be hearing uh, Kate's voice. Kate is his wife. Uh, I actually met Kate ooh, 20, maybe 20 years ago in college. Uh, and then she moved off to England and met Chris and got married to him uh, and had two little girls and now you are up to date with their history, everything that's important, and now they're reading the dictionary for me. All right, Kate, here we go. Hello, word nerds. My name is Kate. I'm friends with Spencer because we did Philosophy 101 together, and we both thought of the Philosopher's Song from Monty Python. 
we both realized that had, was going through our heads the entire time. And he also kind of looked like a goat, which I found mildly amusing. Due to his beard. No other reason. As you can tell, my accent is very strange. Half Chicago, half living in England for too many years. Oh, okay. Not too many years. So, we start with Amniote, noun, 1887. Any of a group, Aminota, of vertebrae that undergo embryonic and fetal development within an amnion and include the birds, reptiles, and mammals. By the birds, I don't think they mean the band. Aminote is the adjective. Amniotic fluid, noun, circa 1855. The serous fluid in which the embryo or fetus is suspended within the amnion. Amnionic sac, noun, 1881. Just as aminon. The next one is pronounced either ant or ament. It's chiefly Scottish and Irish. For our American listeners, two different nations. In 1618 means am not, like I'm not from Scotland, I'm Irish, or I'm not from Ireland, I'm Scottish. Emu bar bital is a noun from 1949. It's a barbiturate, C11, H18, N2, O3, used as a hypnotic and sedative. Sounds fun. Also, it's sodium salt. Good to know. Amoeba. Now, this one comes with a fun picture that looks somewhere between a fried egg that fell on a dirty floor or joke shop vomit that you used to get that never fooled anyone. Is a noun. The plural is amoebas or amoebi. It's from 1855. And it's any of a large genus, genus even, amoeba, of naked rhizopod protozoans. I bet you all remember that episode of Star Trek. With lobed and never anastomosing pseudopodia. It means something, something about a foot. Without permanent orange jellies. Organelles, even? Not orange jellies. <laughs> That's amazing. Go away. <laughs> Horrible man. Or supporting structures and of wide distribution in fresh and salt water and moist territorial environments. Fun. Broadly, a naked rhizopod or other amoebic protozoan. Amoebic, also amoebic. Pretty sure that's the same word. Ambiosis, a variant of ambius. Amoebocyte, from 1892. A noun, a cell, having an amoebatode, form or movements. Amoeboid, also amoebode. Adjective, 1856, resembling an amoeba, specific in moving or changing in shape by means of protoplasmic flow. We've all danced like that. I should go back to the wonderful fake vomit picture of the amoeba and tell you about the numbered bits. One, the outline of the dirty fried egg on a filthy floor, is the pseudopodium. Number two, the dark bit that looks like a bit of sausage, is the nucleus. Number three is the contrelli, vacuole. And number four is the food vacuole, as in, your mama is a food vacuole. Back to our words. Number one, a muck. It's a noun, and it comes from the Malay word, a muck. 1665, a murderous frenzy that has traditionally been regarded as occurring, especially in Malaysian culture. 
really makes you want to visit, doesn't it? Bet they don't have that on the tourism board. Number two, amok. Adverb, 1672. One, in a murderously frenzied state. Two, A, in a violently raging manner. B, in an undisciplined, uncontrolled, or faulty manner. There's an example here. Films about computers run amok. Number three, amok. Adjective. 1944. Moving on with the times. Possessed with or motivated by a murderous or violent uncontrollable frenzy. Apparently we're not moving on very much. Next. A mole. Noun. 1831. A plant part as a root, possessing detergent properties and serving as a substitute for soap. Also, a plant as a yucca or agave, so used. Thank you so much for listening for my first episode. I hope I didn't mess up too much for your word notes. Bye. Thank you very much for that, Kate. Uh, hope to have you back in the future to read more words and describe weird little pictures. Until next time, this is Spencer with help from Kate reading the dictionary. Yup, word nerds, it is that time again. You will be hearing Chris from England reading the fourth quarter of page 41. Do I have anything interesting to say? Have I listened to his episode uh, recently? No, because he sent it to me like a week or two ago and I edited it, edited it right away and I have forgotten everything uh, so yeah, go listen to him right now. Hello, word nerds. It's Chris again from the UK. Uh, I have the honour and privilege to be married to Kate, who is one of Spencer's friends from way back when, when everything was black and white. Uh, we're still ploughing through the A words here, and we're kicking off for this podcast with Among. So... Join me, word nerds, as we go on a journey through the AM words. Among. Also, amongst. It's a preposition. And its etymological background is quite complex, uh, but we can take it back to the Old English mengen to mix. Okay, so this has been around since before the 12th century. It is meaning one. Remember, this is preposition. In or through the midst of. Surrounded by, for example, hidden among the trees. Second meaning, in company or association with. An example here is living among artists. I love these examples. Number three, by or through the aggregate of. For example, discontent among the poor. Who'd have thought? That's because of that. <laughs> living among the artists or hidden among the trees, maybe. Number four, in the number or class of. For example, the wittiest among poets. Among other things, she was president of her college class. Two splendid examples there. Number five, in shares to each of. Uh, example here, like divided among the heirs. Number six, A, through the reciprocal acts of. For example, quarrel among themselves. Or B, through the joint action of. For example, made a fortune among themselves. For usage, see also between. Now, this one's a tricky one for me because I'm a bit old-fashioned in the way I speak, even for an Englishman, uh, and I tend to use amongst. So all those examples there, I would say hidden amongst the trees, living amongst artists, discontent amongst the poor, and so on and so forth, uh, quarrel amongst themselves. But you must understand that that's fairly unusual. That's fairly archaic, even over here. Uh, it's just, a, I suppose, a peccadillo of mine. Talking peccadillos, now we have amontillado. Uh, this is our next word, amontillado. Uh, plural, of course, amontillados. It's a noun. It's uh, a Spanish. Literally, it means done in the manner of Montilla, a town in Andalusia. This one's from 1825. And, of course, it is a medium dry sherry. <laughs> and very tasty, if I may say so. Our next word is amoral. 
This is an adjective. It comes from around 1779. And its meanings are as follows. 1a. Being neither moral nor immoral. Specifically, lying outside the sphere to which moral judgments apply. Uh, an example here is, science as such is completely amoral. And that's from W.S. Thompson, for those Thompson fans. B. Lacking moral sensibility. For example, infants are amoral. Meaning number two. Being outside of or beyond the moral order or a particular code of morals. For example, amoral customs. This gives us the noun amoralism uh, and the noun amorality and the adverb amorally. And yeah, I, I've had quite a few conversations with students where I work about the difference between immoral and amoral. So it's nice to see amoral getting a shout out here. Our next word is amaretto. This is nice seeing as we just had Amontillado. Amaretto, plural is of course amarettos. It's a noun. Uh, you can, because of its uh, origin, we can pluralise it with amaretti, and that's how we often see it, certainly in this country. This is an Italian word, it's a diminutive of amore, uh, so love or cupid, um, from Latin amor, and it uh, stems from about 1622, and it means, of course, cupid, or the second version of cherub, amaretto. Now that's really interesting, because when I saw that, and I linked it um, just now to Amontillado, Amaretto for me is a a drink, an almond flavoured drink, alcoholic uh, liquor, or liqueur as we would say over here. Our next word, word nerds, is Amarist. This one comes from 1581, and it is of course, meaning in its first sense, a devotee of love and especially sexual love. A gallant or a gallant. Uh, number two, one who writes about romantic love. Uh, that gives us the adjective amoristic. Next word, amorite. <laughs> amorite or amorite? Or amorite. <laughs> amorite, with a capital A, this is a proper noun from the Hebrew, 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 from the Hebrew Imori, forgive mispronunciation, 1535, a member of one of various Semitic peoples living in Mesopotamia, Syria and Palestine during the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC. It does of course give us the linked adjective Amorite. Next word is Amorous. It's an adjective of course. Unsurprisingly it comes from Amare to love. It comes from the 14th century and its meaning one is strongly moved by love and especially sexual love. For example, amorous couples. In its second meaning, being in love enamoured, usually used with of. So we could say the example here is amorous of the girl. That's a clunky example, but I see where they're going with that. And it's nice to see the a shout out for amorous of there. Number three, meaning a, indicative of love. Bracket, uh, uh, an example, received amorous glances from her partner. Or 3b, of or relating to love. An example here, an amorous novel. Fifty Shades of Amorousness. It gives us, of course, the adverb amorously and the noun, which usefully I just used, amorousness. Next word, word nerds, is amorphous. I love this word. Uh, it's an adjective from the Greek, of course. Uh, a plus morphe, form. So it's the without form. Uh, comes from around 1731. That's ridiculously specific. Around... 1731. We're not quite sure when it was, but it was definitely 1731. Meaning one, A, having no definite form, shapeless, for example, an amorphous cloud mass. Meaning one, B, being without definite character or nature, unclassifiable, for example, an amorphous segment of society. That's a bit bleak. Meaning one, C, lacking organisation or unity, an example here is an amorphous style of writing. Meaning two, having no real or apparent crystalline form. An amorphous mineral, as an example there. The adverb is, of course, amorphously, and we have the rather clumsy noun amorphousness. Presumably if you're without amorphousness, then you are amorphousnessless. 
Next word, word nerds, is a mort, a word I've not come across. Uh, it's an adjective, and it's apparently short for all a mort by folk etymology, um, from Middle French a la mort, to the death, as in fighting to the death. Uh, so fighting to death. It comes from 1546, it's archaic, I'll say it's archaic. Being at the point of death, there we go, a mort. Mm, not convinced by that. Our next word is is amortization. This is a noun, it comes from 1851, and it means either one, the act or process of amortizing, or two, the result of amortizing. Now, what, you may ask, does amortizing mean? Well, let's find out, word nerds, because our last word for this podcast entry is amortize. It's a transitive verb, uh, and it forms its past tense and form with amortized. It's present with amortizing. This comes from vulgar Latin, uh, ad mortier to kill, from Latin more, ad plus more, so to death. Uh, and it links to the word murder, apparently, um, according to this. So we, we, we come across this from 1867, amortise, and its first meaning is to pay off as a mortgage. Ooh, note the spelling of that, mortgage, of course. Uh, so you can see the cognitive link there, as a mortgage. Gradually, usually by periodic payment of principal and interest, or by payment to a sinking fund. Two, its second meaning, to gradually reduce or write off the cost or value of, as an asset. For example, amortised goodwill, or, for example, amortised machinery. And that gives us, of course, the beautiful word to end our podcast with today, amortisable. And that's the adjectival form. Thank you very much for listening, Word Nerds. I appreciate your time. And uh, it's Chris signing off from the UK. Cheerio. All right. That was Chris. And in the previous episode, it was Kate. And uh, yeah, we will hopefully be hearing them again in the future uh, because I know that they like this project and are avid listeners and avid readers and very smart people with, with very cool accents. Uh, and it you know, it makes things more interesting when you don't have to listen to me all the time. All right, probably in uh, two or three days, I will be reading the next page, page 42, and it's going to be a good one. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Uh, about an hour before I started recording this, I had a very minor accident while walking up some stairs at work. Uh, this is so stupid. I, I don't think I lifted my foot up all the way. I think I was just a little bit lazy. Uh, and so I sort of tripped up the stairs. And when I went to grab onto the railing to catch myself, I just like smacked my pinky real hard onto this metal railing. And I scraped off some skin and it started bleeding. And I think that's the only problem with it. But that did not feel good. I was afraid I had broken my finger or something. And on that fun note, let's get to some words. First is Amos, capital A-M-O-S. This is a noun from before the 12th century, a Hebrew prophet of the 8th century B.C. Uh, so yeah, technically, the uh, first known usage of before the 12th century is accurate. Uh, but if they know when it was, it was the 8th century B.C., uh, maybe they could have put that in there. Two, a prophetic book of canonical Jewish and Christian scripture. And then it says, to see the Bible table. Is it a table made of Bibles? Or a Bible made of tables? Or something different? Next we have Amosite. A-M-O-S-I-T-E. This is a noun from circa 1918. An iron-rich amphibole, or amphiboly, I don't know that word, that is a variety of asbestos. And we should probably be getting to that word amphibole, amphiboly, uh, relatively soon. It is spelled A-M-P-H-I-B-O-L-E. So the etymology says, this is made combining the word amosa, A-M-O-S-A, and the uh, suffix ite, I-T-E. Uh, and interestingly, the word amosa uh, is kind of an acronym. It is from asbestos, mines, of South Africa.
I have a feeling working in those mines is not very safe, and I hope that they have been shut down. All right, next is amount, A-M-O-U-N-T. This is the first form of amount. It is a, an intransitive verb from the 14th century, 1A, to be equivalent, as in acts that amount to treason, 1B, to reach in kind or quality, as in wants her son to amount to something, also doesn't amount to much, 2, to reach a total, add up, as in the bill amounts to $10, that is a cheap bill. The etymology says this is from Anglo-French uh, amount, amount uh, which means upward. Uh, that is from uh, the Latin ad plus mont, which means mountain. And there's more at the word mount. So I guess if you are climbing up a mountain, every step you take uh, eventually amounts to you being at the top. Now we have the second form of amount. Uh, this is a noun from 1595, 1A, the total number or quantity. Synonym is aggregate or aggregate. 1B, the quantity at hand or under consideration, as in has an enormous amount of energy. 2, the whole effect, significance, or import. 3, a principal sum and the interest on it. Now we have some usage information. It says, number is regularly used with count nouns, as in a large number of mistakes, or also as in any number of times, while amount is mainly used with mass nouns, as in annual amount of rainfall, or a substantial amount of money. The use of amount with count nouns has been frequently criticized. It usually occurs when the number of things is thought of as a mass or collection, as in glad to furnish any amount of black pebbles, that is from the New Yorker, or as in a substantial amount of film offers, that is from Lily Tomlin, or when money is involved, as in a substantial amount of loans. And that is from E.R. Black. So that is some specific usage information on the word amount. Now we have the word amour, A-M-O-U-R. This is a noun from the 14th century, a usually illicit love affair. Also, the synonym lover. The etymology says this is uh, Middle English from Anglo-French. It says it's an old Ossetan or Occitan uh, amor, A-M-O-R, from the Latin amare, which means to love. Now we have amor propra or propra. Uh, it's the word amor. Second word is P-R-O-P-R-E. This is a noun from 1775. It just has the synonym self-esteem. Uh, this is from the French, or it is French, uh, and it literally means love of oneself. Next, we have amoxicillin, spelled A-M-O-X-I-C-I-L-L-I-N. This is a noun from 1971, a semi-synthetic penicillin, C16H19N305S, derived from ampicillin. Next, we have the same word, but it is spelled A-M-O-X-Y-C-I-L-L-I-N, and it is the British variation of the word we just read, amoxicillin with an I. Now we have amoy, capital A-M-O-Y. This is a noun from 1904, the dialect of Chinese spoken in and near uh, Xiamen, and then in parentheses it says Amoy, in southeastern China. Xiamen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, it is X-I-A-M-E-N. Uh, and then Amoy is in parentheses after that word. I don't know if that means it's another name for that region uh, or what, but that's what that is. Now we have the word AMP, A-M-P, uh, the first form. This is a noun from 1886. One. We just have the synonym ampere, A-M-P-E-R-E. -E. Number two, 
we have the synonym amplifier, also a unit consisting of an electronic amplifier and a loudspeaker. Now we have the second form of amp. It is a verb from 1972, uh, transitive actually. We have the synonyms excite and energize, often used with the word up, as in trying to amp up the crowd. Also, we have the synonyms heighten and intensify, also often used with the word up, as in amp up the drama. Now we have another word amp, but this is all caps. It is a noun from 1951, a nucleotide C10H12N503H2P04 composed of adenosine and one phosphate group that is reversibly convertible to ADP and ATP in metabolic reactions, called also adenosine monophosphate adenylic acid, and it says compared to cyclic AMP. And uh, in the past, I have read ADP and ATP will be coming up in the future. Uh, I think we'll do one more for this episode. Amperage, A-M-P-E-R-A-G-E. This is a noun from 1893. The strength of a current of electricity expressed in amperes. And the next word is actually ampere. Uh, but I'm going to leave this as a cliffhanger for you, so uh, you will be very excited to get to the next episode. All right, I think that ends this one. Thank you so much for listening. Contact info, if you want to say anything to me, is in the episode description. Uh, Of course, there's Patreon and rating and reviewing and do all those things. Thank you and goodbye.